All right. We are continuing from the last video. Deuteronomy chapter 4. The, this is part 2 of why do the children suffer? Okay? You need to watch the first part of this video. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 20. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Balpeor. For all the men that followed Balpeor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them? As the Lord our God is in all things that we call him for, call upon him for, so see, Israel were to be the example of the Lord's judgments, righteousness, and statutes. It would be their wisdom, their fear of the Lord. It would be uh, an example of our Lord's righteous judgments and statutes and stuff by them, see. So if God, would have a, God forgave David, put away his sin, didn't kill him, but see, because of that, because he forgave David, the child of that union, okay? David, you, yeah, God used David after his sin, but never forget what it cost David, okay? Now let's continue. And what nation is there so great and has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day, and as we have already looked at in the previous video, other nations, the Philistines, Rahab the harlot, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So God's reputation, God's name was being known for what? For his judgment. Okay? Verse 9. Verse 9, only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Remember, this is under the dispensation of the law, okay? Explain that in the other video, okay? Lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And he came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the mist of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words but saw no similitude, only you, ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded to you to perform, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. So see, God was to be known by his people, the children of Israel, among the heathen. And the way they served him reflected him. Okay? And then when you had King David committing murder, adultery, and stealing, God forgave him. But look at what it cost him. 
Okay? Let's continue. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that ye might do them in the land whither ye go over to possess it. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, like the third member of the satanic Catholic trinity is a bird. Yeah. The likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven, unto those who are not of the church of the living God for our instruction and righteousness, you're not, you don't belong to God. Yeah, you, you're, yeah. You want that? Go ahead. You want the truth? You come to the Lord Jesus Christ on his terms. Verse 20. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. See, back then in the Old Testament, Israel was to be the ambassadors of God to live by his statutes, his testimonies, his, his precepts and stuff like that. And the way King David served the Lord after the way the Lord blessed him and doing that with uh, Bathsheba and killing Uriah, it reflected upon the Lord. And he let him live. David should have died. Both David and Bathsheba should have died. But no, that didn't happen. Why? Because the Lord was merciful. What it cost David. Again. Okay. Okay. Now go to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Verses 1. Under verse 18. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, separate, other than. Not be like the world to win the world. Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourselves molten gods. I am the Lord your God. That's exactly what Catholicism does. That's why they removed the second commandment. And if ye offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. It shall be eaten the same day ye offer it, and on the morrow. And if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if it be eaten at all on the third day, it is abominable. It shall not be accepted. Therefore, every one that eateth it shall bear his iniquity, because he hath profaned the hallowed thing of the Lord. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field. Neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest, and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard. Neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. See, that's talking about not being selfish, leaving something for the poor and needy. While David's actions were all about self, all about himself. The whole world revolved around David. Sound familiar, devil? Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. Oh, did I skip one? No, no, I did not. Verse 12. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, 
Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Look at verse 12. And I ask you. By David's act. We already looked at it in the previous video. David, according to the scripture for what he did, deserved to die. What did David do? He profaned the name of his God. But God forgave him. At the heaviest price, the price of death. Let's continue. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. What he did to Uriah. The wages of him that is hired shall not be shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put any put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God. I am the Lord. And that's what these devils do. They curse the deaf and put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall not do unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. In righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. And you're not to have respect on the poor, weak-looking people, or the mighty, rich-looking people. No. We are to judge righteously. How do you judge righteously? Thou shalt not go up and down as a tail bearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Those who are of the church of the living God. I might not like you. If you are my brother, I might not like you. But I don't hate you if you're my brother. Okay? Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. And not suffer sin on him. Now, note the difference there. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. In thine heart. Who is my brother today? Those who are of the church of the living God. Thou shalt thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. Your neighbor could be your brother or someone who is lost. And not suffer sin upon him. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Thou shalt not avenge, get even, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. He's talking about vengeance again. Defending yourself in the heat of a moment and confrontation, God is okay for that. Okay? He's okay for that. He, that's not sin. But if you want to go get vengeance, vengeance belongs on to who? Okay? Now, go to Leviticus chapter 22. Verses 31 on to verse 33. Again, Israel, like we today, we of the church of the living God, we are ambassadors. We have the word of of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation okay we are ambassadors for Christ in the Old Testament Israel being set apart as his nation we already looked at it in Deuteronomy chapter 4 they were to be the, the representatives of our Lord okay that's what they were there for to shew the greatness of our Lord okay here's another reminder of it Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 31 under verse 33. Therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord which hallow you, that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. The way you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, reflects him. And there are those out there who want you to believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is this non-judgmental doormat who 
has no requirements and is actually a coward himself. Yeah. Yeah. Go to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verses 19, under verse 32. Psalm 89, verses 19, under verse 32. Okay? Then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One, and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him. Nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face. And plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Prophecy about our Lord Jesus Christ, obviously, this is talking about. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed, this is talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Prophecy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Let's read verse 33. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. And see, when it came to David, he didn't take away his faithfulness or his mercy from him. But he sure did visit his transgression with the rod. Why? Because David profaned the name of the Lord. The Lord who had done everything for him. See, this ought to scare the hell out of you, Church of the Living God. Those of you wicked devils about how you're uh, prancing around pretending you're a Christian. Okay? This ought to scare you. Because King David, yes, God used him. What did it cost him? Absalom. Ammonon, Tamar, getting kicked out of his own city. The infant, the babe that was born, the firstborn there. And many other things. God still used them. But he paid a heavy price. Why? Because Israel, especially King David, was to be God's ambassador. God's nation. Okay? Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, one verse, Proverbs 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous runneth into it and is safe, and while we are here, Proverbs 30, verses 1, on to verse 6. Proverbs 30, verses 1, on to verse 6. The words of Agur, the son of Zekeh, even the prophecy, the man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Yuko. Surely I am more brutish than any man, and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? 
Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And by the way, those Bibles, they ain't the word of God. See, some will take that verse and twist that to say, well, every Bible says the same thing, so they're all the word of God. No. The scriptures, the authorized version, this is the word of God. Anything else is not. You use this and translate this, the authorized version, into other tongues. Okay? This is your base text. Here it is. Okay? But what is the son's name? If thou canst tell. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and is safe. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Philippians chapter 2. I read this in the video yesterday. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 on to verse 11. Let this mind be in you, which also is, which also, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every th and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved is Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Jesus Christ. Jehovah saves. Beg your pardon, brethren. Jehovah saves Jesus Christ. Okay. Now go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Verses 11. On to verse 13. Uh, in the previous video I mentioned about how um, in the Old Testament the Lord said I'll give to everybody according to their deeds. Revelation chapter 22. Now, see, I, I have a Cambridge, and in the Cambridge, in the book of Revelation, there are no red words. But if you have a set of scripture and you have red words here, uh, who's saying this? Revelation chapter 22, verses 11 on to verse 13. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Yeah, you want to go ahead and do this thing of the world, you little wicked devil? Go ahead. Let him be a, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So see, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. One God comprised of spirit, soul, and body, our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Isaiah chapter 42. 
Isaiah chapter 42. Oops. Isaiah chapter 42. Verses 5 on to verse 8. Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. See, you have breath. God gave it to you. You have spirit. That's a lowercase s. You have the spirit of man in you. You, if you are not saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, you have the spirit of man. The spirit of man is that spirit of Antichrist. The Lord saves you. You have the Holy Ghost. And the Lord is that spirit dwelling within you, see. But see, whether you want to admit this or not, God has given you life, he has given you breath, and that spirit you have, he gave it to you. It's not himself. You get that when you come to him broken, on, you know, on his terms, okay? But right there, God created you, God made you. You're not going to get away from that. It doesn't really matter if you want to believe it or accept it or not. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. And will hold thine hand. I will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven Catholic images. I am the Lord, that is my name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every knee sh and every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Hmm. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Hmm. All right, now go to Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, verses 1, on to verse 6. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise, and then sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. Lose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. The blood of God, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord? that my people is taken away for naught. They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord. And my name continually every day, every day is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in the day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. Read that again. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. And unless you believe I am he, you shall die in your sins. I think the Lord is a little bit jealous about his name. Also about his word. Because it says in the scriptures, in Psalm 138, especially, you have elevated your word above your name. I mean, he's staked everything on his word. 
You think God staked everything on the NIV? On the ESV? <laughs> and on these perverse Jewish translations? Son, the authorized version, King James Version, this is a Jewish book. This is a Jewish book. Not get, this was not given to us by Rome. This was given to us by God. This is a Jewish book. Now, go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. See, we're going through all this to show you that by David's actions, God forgave him. Okay, because Jesus Christ, as the son of David, king of the Jews, will reign upon David's throne as king of the Jews when he come back with us, the church of the living God, his body. Uh, when he come back with us, he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem as the son of David, king of the Jews. Okay? But God forgave David, as we've already looked at previously. But that forgiveness cost a heavy price, cost death. Death. And isn't it interesting that the firstborn between Bathsheba and David had to die because of what David had done? Because if, think about it, we've already looked in the previous video, okay? Children of Israel, David, they were to be God's ambassadors, God's holy, set apart, other nation from all the world. Okay, Israel were to be the shining light unto the lost world. Today, in this dispensation, the body of Christ, the church of the living God, we are ambassadors for Christ, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. A Gentile is someone who is not a Jew, okay? But we are to be that ambassador for Christ, that Christ may shine through us, okay? But because of what David did, and the enemies, the world, the nations know about God, but because God allowed him to live, God could not allow that innocent child, God could not allow that innocent child to live. Why? Because his name was at stake. After all he did, the miracles at Egypt, uh, upon Egypt, all of that, even his word, okay? God's name was at stake because of what David did. God could not allow that child to live. Because if, they, if he did, he let David live and Bathsheba and the child. The enemies would have blasphemed the Lord. God had to do that. And it was of no fault of the child himself or herself, we don't know. That child that David, between Bathsheba and David, that child was innocent. God took him because of what David did. You see? Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 16 on to verse 24. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Uncleanness as of a removed woman. Beg your pardon. He's talking about when a woman has that time of the month and removed, okay? Wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through, through the countries, 
according to their way and according to their doings, I judge them. And we already looked at that in Revelation chapter 22. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New. One God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, okay? Verse 20. And when they entered onto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of this land. Look at that verse. And when they entered in and when they entered onto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. I think the Lord really has takes care for his name. Let everyone who named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. How you doing with that, brother, sister? The way you serve the Lord reflects our Lord. Remember, you're to live as a testimony unto the lost. What are they seeing in you? Hmm. Are they seeing you compromise, preaching a love gospel? Are you getting along with everybody? Hmm? Are they seeing you being just like them? Because lost people... Come on, you lost people. Come on. Come on. You know deep down when you got some Christian coming up to you, God loves you. God's not angry at you. God's not going to judge you. We just love you. You know there's something not right with that. Don't you? How are you serving the Lord? What are they seeing in you? Verse 21 really hammers this. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this, for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. Look at that verse. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you for their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Of course he did that. He brought them out, uh, brought them back to their own land in unbelief. Fulfillment of prophecy. But for his great name, he did that. Not for our sakes. You know, the Lord didn't save you for your own sake, but for his name's sake. And you as the church of the living God. Are you blaspheming his name? Are you making his name look weak? Think about this. You're out there preaching this love gospel. Easy believism, pacifism. You're preaching another Jesus. You're making the lost to see a Jesus who is not described in Scripture. 
who's the one really doing the blaspheming here? Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 21 under verse 23. Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 21 on to verse 23. Now see, we, the church of the living God, we are ambassadors for Christ. Okay? We are of the church of the living God. We bear the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as the church of the living God. Okay? People like to say, well, you have the name of Christ. You're anointed, so it's okay to call you Christian. No, it's not. Stop it. No, it's not covered this many times before okay we never referred to ourselves as Christians Peter did it in comparison it's better to die as a Christian than to die as a murderer and whatever okay he was not saying it's okay all right I don't care what history has said scripture says something else but as bearing the name of our Lord as the church of the living God Verses 21 on to verse 23 in Ezekiel chapter 38. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And of course, too, think about the time of Jacob's trouble. When you have that man of sin, the son of perdition, coming out uh, midway through saying, I am God. He's going to look like the Roman Catholic Jesus. Verse 22. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. Plead is not, oh, please. No, plead as a lawyer pleads, okay? And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Talking about judgment during the time of Jacob's trouble. This is pertaining about the time of Jacob's trouble, by the way. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And oh, oh, we're not done yet. We're not yet done in Ezekiel chapter 39 now, okay? Ezekiel chapter 39. Therefore, thou son of man, uh, verses 1 under verse 7 in Ezekiel chapter 39. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel, and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee, and I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Again, so will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. God has a lot to do for his name. And how is the name of the Lord proclaimed today? Through the scripture. Because now, go to Psalm 138. We made mention of this, okay? 
Psalm 138. Is this too much scripture for you, huh? Sorry, that, that brings a tear to my glass eye. Okay? Psalm 138. I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods. Little G, will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. How do you, how do you learn of the name of the Lord? How do you learn of our Lord? Through the scriptures. So, in order for you, the lost person, to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is, the truly Lord Jesus Christ, you learn of him through the scriptures. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay? That, that's what Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and on is about. Those who are sent out to preach the word. So God's name is known unto you through the scriptures. So obviously he has magnified his word above his name because his great name that we have been constantly looking at thus far is glorified how? Through the scriptures. That's why, dear people, when you have a grotesque Bible version like the NIV, ESV, uh, NLT, or whatever it is, the complete Jewish Bible, or whatever it is, when you have one of these things, those Bibles that come to you from Rome, they are blaspheming the name of our Lord. They are spitting on the scriptures. That's why I am so personally adamant about defending the authorized version of the scriptures. You don't have the, the King James Version. You don't have the Scriptures. It's that simple. What about other tongues? Here you go. Translate this into other tongues. Translate this into other tongues. You're saying they have to learn English then to uh, translate it. You're saying they have to learn Hebrew and Greek. Aren't you? Right back at you there, tough guy. The seven purification process was completed in English. This is what God has chosen. You use this, the English text, to translate this into other tongues. You don't have the scriptures. You don't have the King James Version. You don't have the, what God said. I don't care if you're the guy who translated it for you, boy, is Jesuit educated, or even a Jew himself. This is God's perfect and errant given by inspiration word. Deal with it. Why don't you like it? You can't understand it? Get saved. Can't understand it? Or does it cut you, boy? That's what it is, isn't it? Because it cuts you. Cuts you. You don't like how it cuts you, do you? That's why you want to uh, go sissy and preach the love of God, which is not the love of God. You're damning people to hell. Brad, you're using that. You know what? I don't want to see my enemies in hell. But if you've made yourself an enemy of my Lord Jesus Christ, God my Father, you are my enemy. I don't want to see my, my worst enemy in hell. I don't. But you got to remember, as we've been looking at, God is just. And God is a God of judgment. Let's continue. Verse 3. In the day when I cried, thou answeredest me. And strengthenest me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. 
but the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not, thou, forsake not the work of thine own hands. Amen. Amen. Now, go to John chapter 14. He has uh, elevated, he has exalted his word above his own name. You learn of the name of the Lord and the power of the name of our Lord through the scriptures. Okay? It's not a contradiction. John chapter 14. Verses 1 under verse 14. Oh, Trinitarians hate this. Let not your heart, your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, shew us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Look at verse 7. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Verse 9. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? <laughs> This is like so simple. And these wicked Jesuits and their satanic trinity <clears throat> like to twist this. This is so simple. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? Uh, essence, by the way, find the word essence. In the authorized version of the scriptures. Yeah. So, he that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, shew us the Father? If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the Father. Unless you believe I am he, ye shall die in your sins. It's very simple. The Trinitarians are the one who make it hard for you. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the soul of the Godhead? The Godhead is spirit, the Holy Ghost. Soul, God the Father, body, the Word made flesh. Okay? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. According to his will, of course. Okay. But see, Jesus is God the Father. And God is very jealous over his name. We've already looked at that. But yet, 
He's exalted his word above his name. You learn about who God is, again, through the scriptures. So in order for you to learn about our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the only name given among men under heaven by where we must be saved, by whom we must be saved, excuse me, is Jesus Christ, God our Father. You learn of him through the authorized version of the scriptures, not a Bible. Those Bibles, I'm pointing that way because I have Bibles on the bottom of my bookshelf there. Um, Bibles, those Bibles, God has not inspired. This is God given by inspiration word of God, the authorized version. By the time some of you are going to figure that out, Fortunately, it will be too late for you. Because let's go now to John chapter 17. Verses 14 on to verse 18. John 17. Verses 14 on to verse 18. The true Lord's Prayer. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so, have I also sent them into the world. So, go back now to 2 Samuel, chapter 12. Looking at verse 14. Let's read verses 13 and 14, okay? And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Again, David isn't pulling a Saul, trying to blame other people. He took full responsibility and accountability. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Showed you in the previous video uh, the scriptures proving that, that yes, David should have been killed. Same with Bathsheba. Verse 14. Howbeit by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee, shall surely die. And as we have seen, God is very jealous of his name. We've been through countless scriptures to show you that. And see, as talked about in the previous video, David's sin immediately direct, uh, affected his unborn child. That child himself or herself did nothing, was innocent. But God had no choice. Yes, he could have let, let them all live. But his name, which he is very jealous about, and cares about his name, would have been blasphemed by the enemies because of what David did. And yes, Dave, David was used mightily of God, even after he sinned. Look what it cost him. It cost him everything. Okay? Look at what it cost him. Now, let's pick up in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 19 on to verse 23. Now, of course, the child gets sick and then dies. And while the child is sick, David mourns, weeps, and fasts, okay? You know what? We should, we should just read from verses 15 on to verse 23, okay? Let's do that, okay? And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. 
And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. And look at this. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself. What? And changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and when he required they set bread before him, and he did eat. Now, look at that verse. Don't look at me. Look at the verse. He found out that the child was dead. He arose and anointed himself. He, he worshipped. He worshipped. Kind of like Job. Naked came I into this world, and naked shall I return hither. The Lord gave. The Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this. Did not Job sin with his lips or charge God foolishly? See? And then he was fasting, and then he found out about the child and whatnot. He anointed himself, worshiped. Then he went, and it's like, give me some food. I'm, I'm hungry. And you can picture these, his servants as like, uh, what, 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 what? What's going on? Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? What, what's going on here? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread? Look at this. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? And unfortunately, we already proved that that could not happen. Verse 23. But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Look at this. I shall go to him. He shall not return to me. I shall go to him. And David is in heaven, okay? But he shall not return to me. This child that the Lord struck and made sick and killed it, we have, without a doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt, have shown you that because of his name, because of what David did, the Lord had no choice for his namesake. He let David live. So he killed the child. But this child was innocent. This child did nothing. But that child suffered because of what David had done. And David wept and mourned and fasted. But in verse 23, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. Come on. Malachi chapter 1. Verses 1 under verse 3. God's judgment. The, ultimately, brethren, why do the children suffer? Children being sacrificed and children who are aborted. 
Those children who are aborted, those children have done nothing. It's their father and mother who don't want to be burdened with the gift of a child. So they kill it by aborting it. And those who sacrifice their children onto devils, they do it for their own gain. But look at this. Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 and verse 3. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved, past tense, you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and hated Esau. It doesn't say he hated his sin. It said that he hated Esau. And laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. So God loved Jacob and hated Esau. And before they were born, God gave a prophecy because God can see into the future. He knew what these children would do. But see, God is a fair God. He is just. He is righteous. His judgment is perfect. He is a righteous judge. He doesn't lead anyone around by force. You have to choose. He saves you. But he doesn't bring you to himself by force. And he knew that Jacob, who grabbed his brother by the heel, supplanter, grabbed his brother by the heel, he knew that Esau would sell away his birthright because his God was his belly. Because he was hungry. He thought he was going to die. That's why he hated Esau. And he knew that before they were born. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Verses 4 and verse 10. The word of the Lord, the, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Well, if God knows who people are going to be, then, then why does he... Listen, okay? God doesn't want a robot. God knows what's going to happen. God knows who are his. But he would not, will, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Even though he knows you who are lost, who will ultimately refuse him in the end. Even though he knows he's going to be doing that, you're going to do that. He would not be a just and right God if he didn't give you his long suffering and ample chance for you to come to repentance. He would not be a fair and just and righteous God. I know that's really hard for a lot of you wicked perverts out there to get into your head because you're lost. You are spiritually discerned. You can't understand the things of the Spirit. I get that. Okay? But see, even though God knows what's going to happen, He knows that some of you... You're going to hear the true gospel and you're going to reject him until you die and you're going to go to hell and you're going to deserve to go there because you rejected what he did for you on the cross. Okay? You didn't go to him on his terms. You went up some other way. Okay? Okay? Even though God knows you're going to do that. He would not be fair. He would not be just. He would not be doing right if he didn't allow you give you the chance to repent today. See, y'all get so high and mighty thinking that your ways are equal. Are not the Lord's ways equal and yours unequal? Verse 6, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. 
for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Okay? Now go to First Kings. First Kings, chapter 14. These children who are aborted before the age of accountability, and, and thank you to Brother Alexander who uh, answered the one, uh, the one question that was asked. There, in the scriptures, it does not say the age of accountability. <laughs> Bravo, it does not. No, but see, a child has to understand the significance of number one, they are a sinner, and number two, they are a sinner against God, and number three, the consequence of you being a sinner and your sin against God and what he had to do to open the way of salvation onto you by grace through faith. And a child, you know, I, I will go on record as saying there are probably some teenage kids out there who can't get that. See, it's ultimately dependent on the Lord and the child. Okay, because I'm going to tell you, uh, a child from seven to, I, I think, to at least 12, maybe 13, you're not going to tell a 12-year-old. I mean, you can tell them they're sinner, they can know about it, but are they going to grasp the enormity, the gravity of what that means? No, there's no way. Is it possible? Okay, yeah, but that's dependent on the Lord. Okay, a child... It's not from a child, you know, anywhere from uh, birth, uh, I believe, up to 12 years old, maybe even 13, maybe even up to 16. Who knows? It depends on the Lord. But see, they have to know that they're a sinner, know that they've sinned, to God, you know, sinned against God, and what that means, what the death, burial, and resurrection means, why he did that, and the fact that they themselves are responsible for it. And a 12-year-old? A 13-year-old, even a 15-year-old probably ain't going to get that. Okay? Hence, hence, yes, a child is known by that. We're going to look at that. Okay? But a child, before they are totally accountable, knowing the gravity, the enormity of what it means, they're innocent. Hence, I firmly believe that children who are before that age, whatever that age is, that's dependent on the Lord and the child. It's dependent on the Lord. That's why I believe that children are going to be caught up. Uh, some will ask, well, what about those children that are birthed uh, as a result of the steal of Jesuit Poniard? We'll see. I don't know. No, those children can crawl in two weeks and walk in three months. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But go to first king or second kings. What did I tell you? First kings. First kings chapter 14. Thank your pardon. First kings chapter 14 verses 1 under verse 16. At that time, Abijah, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Asia, the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. And take with thee ten loaves and cracknels, and a cruse of honey, and go to him. He shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, Shiloh, excuse me, and came to the house of Asia. 
But Asia could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. And the Lord said unto Asia, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, for it shall be, when she cometh in, that she shall feign herself to be another woman. And it was so, when Asia, when Asia heard the sound of her feet, as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Go, tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel. Hmm, doesn't this sound a little similar to what happened to David? And rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes. But hast done evil above all that were before thee, for thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung. Till it, be gone, till it be all gone. So our Lord just compared the house of Jeroboam to dung. And Jeroboam did what? He was appointed. We just read it. And what did he do? He served other gods. And it was Jeroboam. Jeroboam. Who set up the calves. The counterfeit in Samaria. Counterfeit. Um, for instruction in righteousness, a counterfeit Christ. Verse 11. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord has spoken it. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house. And when thy feet enter into the city... The child shall die, and all Israel and all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave. Look at this, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. So whatever that was in that child, the Lord saw some good thing in him. What was that? Maybe an innocence? Maybe. But nevertheless, the child died. But yet, what did the Lord say? And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward the, toward the Lord God of Israel in the, in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam, Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now. And that was Jehu who would raise up. For the Lord shall... I think it was Jehu. If I'm wrong, forgive me. For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of, his, out of this good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. Okay? So out of all Jeroboam, one child would go to the grave and be mourned for, because there was something good that the Lord saw in that child. Now go to Proverbs. We're almost done, by the way. If you've made it through these two parts, <laughs> good for you. Proverbs 20, verses 6, on to verse 13. 
Now, pay attention to this, okay? Proverbs 20, verses 6 on to verse 13. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. If you are constantly having to tell people about yourself, about how good you are, how weak you are, how humble you are, eh, that's a good sign that you're not. I remember Sam Gipp had made the statement, I don't have a pride problem. Oh, and you look at what Sam Gipp has become. Uh, yeah, I would say he has a big pride problem. If you have to constantly remind people about how you are and what you are, that kind of stuff, the fact that you're a safe sinner, not talking about that. But if you have to exalt yourself in whatever capacity it is, you know, by... Um, you know, self-glorifying yourself through weakness. Glorifying yourself in your weakness, not the Lord. Uh, that's a sign of pride. And, and what does that say? Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find, if you have to constantly exalt yourself, even, uh, even if it's of, I feel like Paul for what I've done, or I'm so weak, look at me. Um, it's a good chance that you're not a faithful person. Just saying. The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. A king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth, scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sins. Oh, that's right, you can because you saved yourself because you just believe. Yeah. You've made your heart pure. You've, you've cleansed yourself by your own sin. Why? Because you just believe. Get over yourself. Go take a long walk off of a short pier, buddy. Divers' weights and divers' measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. Right here. Even a child is known by his doing. Okay? Whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Yes, a child is known by his doing, whether it be pure and whether it be right. But see, in that verse alone, there's no implication of guilt because he's a child. Verse 12, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Tie that in with verse 11. The, a child is known even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Meaning, the Lord sees and hears. Because you hear and you see, right? Well, you don't think he does? Okay, let's continue. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Now, finally, let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Tie this up real nice for you. Why do the children suffer? Generally, because of the sins of fathers. And yet we looked at earlier in the, um, and, uh, in the previous video, yes. But when regards to abortion, and children who are under the age of accountability, whatever age that is, there is no set age. It's dependent on the Lord and on, on the child. Before a child can truly grasp what it means to be a sinner, that they sinned against God, and what it means about the death, burial, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, The blood that cleanseth the way. The fact that it's their fault. Before a child can get that, before they can truly understand that, they're innocent. Even though a child is known by his own doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. But see, children that are killed, murdered by abortion. Like, you know, 
David's child that was the Lord struck. He's up there in heaven. David said, I will go to him, but he will not come to me. David's in heaven. I know that there are those of you at the Church of the Living God, both brothers and sisters, in your lost life, have gone through the horror of abortion. God forgives you if you are of the Church of the Living God. And you will see them again. But not yet. Not yet. God can forgive you. Okay? And that son, that daughter, that child that you aborted as a lost person, you came to the Lord broken, contrite, and fear of the Lord, called upon his name, and he saved you, and you're a new creature, you're forgiven for that. He's not going to hold that against you. And you will see that child again. But see, if you're a thief and a robber, you save yourself, you make yourself pure by your own belief, you save yourself, you lying scumbag devil, um, God's going to hold that against you because you're not saved. You need to be saved. Why do the children suffer? Because of their father and mother today. When a child reaches that age, when they get it, and they, they follow that their father, and we looked at that in already in Ezekiel chapter 18 at the beginning of the first video, okay? Okay? See, that child then is accountable. He knows. Because he's able to see his father. It's like, wow, what, what you're doing is evil. I don't want to do what you know. But a child before that stage, they're innocent. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 on to verse 14. And then we'll be done. At the same time came the disciples of, unto Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus, and now kingdom of heaven. It's talking about the actual physical kingdom that's in Jerusalem, where our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be ruling and reigning as king. Okay? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that doesn't mean suck your thumb goo goo. No, what that means is dependent on Christ. See, you easy believism devils. You're dependent on yourself. Why? Because you save yourself by your own belief, you idiot. But see, to be converted, you're dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ by grace through faith. You filthy scoundrel scum easy believism devils who are bringing people to hell. You are not dependent on the Lord. You're self-sufficient. I, I don't want to see you guys go to hell. I really don't. You know, Smiley, I don't want to see you in hell. My dear friend from Blackpool, I don't want to see him in hell. He's definitely going there. But I don't want to see him in hell. But God's judgment is just. He is a righteous God. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? See, coming to him as a little child means dependent on someone greater than yourself. <gasps> wow, what a concept. And see, when you save yourself by your own belief, you're self-sufficient. What else can I say? Let's continue. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. 
<laughs> Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Those of you preaching another Christ, woe unto you, boy. Woe unto you. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now, he's not talking about literal mutilation. What is he talking about? What does it say? Hand or foot. Playing with your hands. If you're touching things that you shouldn't, cut it off. Stop it. If your feet are leading you to sin, if your feet are leading you to sin by people you are hanging around with, brother, cut them off. Stop. Okay? And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. What does that mean? I shall set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of those that turn aside. What are you putting before your eyes? Hmm? What are you putting before your eyes? Are you looking at things you shouldn't? Hmm? That's not just talking about porn or Hollywood movies, huh? You married? You looking at another woman? Huh? You're married as a woman? A sister? You looking at another man? Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Meaning because they're innocent until they are aware of the implications of what it is to be a sinner who is chief. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye? If a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish." It's not the will of our Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And you go back to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Why do the children suffer? Why do children suffer? Because of the sins of the father. Because of the sins of the mother. And when a child reaches that age where they can grasp what it means that they have sinned against the Lord, that they are born a sinner, and that they can't save themselves, and what it means, the death, burial, and resurrection, that it's their fault, until a child reach that, reaches that age, they're innocent even though a child is known by his own doings. The children who are aborted, murdered, children who die before that age, they're innocent. Their angels always behold the face of, that, of his father, our father that is in heaven. Hmm. And, and you know, what, what was that in Genesis? I took my glasses off. Genesis chapter 8, uh, Genesis chapter 18. I took my glasses off, so bear with me. Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 under verse 25. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after the, this manner, 
to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked? That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. The real little children, they're innocent. It's when a child is aware and becomes knows the implications of what it means to be a sinner who is chief. Why do the children suffer? The answer is man. Anyway, I hope this has answered the question for you. Uh, this was a little bit longer than I intended, but I had a lot of stuff to go through. So, Thank you, brethren, sisters, Church of the Living God. Thank you all very much for your help, for your prayers, for your prayers especially. And thank you to those of you who have been there for us, who have prayed for us, who love us. We love you, and we pray for all of you. Even for some of our enemies, we pray for. Some of them. There are some of our enemies who we know for certain have chosen to uh, choose Satan, and we just pray that God's righteous judgment be upon them. In that righteous judgment, hopefully they will come to repentance. So, that's going to be it for this video. Going to upload that other one, and um, yeah, that's going to be it. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. We love you. We'll see you in the next video.